Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Andrew Hanselcheck. I'm the Director of Veterinary Medicine at Mir Vista Diagnostics. And the purpose of this uh, short presentation is to discuss the diagnosis of blastomycosis in small animals, um, specifically dogs and cats. Uh, we'll talk about the clinical findings. To interpret any diagnostic test, there has to be some degree of clinical suspicion, and it's important to, to have a firm understanding of the clinical findings. We'll talk about the diagnostic tests, specifically cytopathology, the detection of fungal antigens, and the detection of antibodies. And we'll finish up with a little bit on treatment monitoring. Blastomyces is considered a dimorphic fungus. There are three important dimorphic pathogenic fungi in the US that infect dogs and cats. There's blastomyces, there's histoplasma, and there's coccidioides. And that's because it's a mold in the environment and it's a yeast in the body. This is not a contagious disease, but it's a disease of environmental exposure. Risk factors are being outside, running around outside in rural areas, and especially living close to a body of water. Now, with that being said, cats that never leave the house can become infected with blastomycosis. And so I think that just speaks to the ubiquitous nature of this organism in the U.S. And really, the enzootic region is anywhere east of the United States. And this uh, overlaps heavily with one of the other dimorphic pathogenic fungi that we mentioned, and that's histoplasma. So the clinical findings, blastomycosis is more common in dogs as compared to cats. It does happen in both species. And since the lung is the first place of infection, it makes sense that it's one of the most common organs involved at the time of diagnosis. Other commonly involved organs include lymph nodes, skin, the eyes, bones and joints, and in a male intact dog, a testicle and prostate. Clinical signs are often nonspecific. So anorexia, weight loss, lethargy, fever unresponsive to antibiotics are pretty common in most cases. Cough and tachypnea may be an indication of lung disease, lameness, might suggest bone involvement. Vision disturbance can be found when, when the eyes are involved. And then cutaneous lesions are also possible. And I'll show you some of those pictures. I think the most important thing to remember about thoracic radiographs with pulmonary blastomycosis is that it can do anything. Any lung pattern is possible. In this radiograph, you can see a diffuse structured interstitial pattern, structured meaning that there are kind of small nodules or kind of a miliary pattern is another term that's used. One of the commonalities is often this is a diffuse disease. This is another radiograph, again, a, a structured kind of diffuse interstitial pattern. There's some areas that are much less structured, but then there's also a larger mass-like lesion in the left caudal lung here. So blastomycosis can imitate pulmonary neoplasia very well in some cases. In this radiograph, you can see we have alveolar disease in the cranial lung fields here. We have border effacement of the heart. We have an air bronchogram. Um, the lung is still diffusely involved. There's a, a structured interstitial pattern here, but we have that very obvious alveolar disease. And that, that looks a lot like bronchopneumonia, bacterial bronchopneumonia. And sometimes you only have an alveolar pattern. So if you have an animal that's being treated for bacterial bronchopneumonia and they're not responding the way that they should, can consider a fungal organism like blastomyces. And then this one has a very large mass-like lesion in the caudal lung. The rest of the lung is pretty normal. And I think the first thing that many of us would think about in this case is a tumor. Um, but this is actually a very large um, blastomyces granuloma in the lung. Blastomyces likes the bone. And in this case, the tibia is affected. The arrow here is at a lytic lesion in the tibia. There's also some proliferation of this bone lesion. It likes the skin. These can be cutaneous or subcutaneous lesions. They can be ulcerative. They can be mass-like with draining tracts. In this case, it's just a small ulcerative lesion in a dog with disseminated blastomycosis. And it likes the eyes. And so I'm gonna show you a few pictures of, of the eyes here. This is a subretinal granuloma um, here in the non-tapetal part of the fundus. You can see the gray color and, and the hemorrhages there in that area. Here's a closer up image of a retinal hemorrhage and a subretinal granuloma. You can see the little hemorrhages there. You can see the gray to white color of this. This is in the tapetal fundus. Um, you can see that it looks kind of raised in that area. And the anterior segment of the eye is also commonly affected. In this case, we have some scleral injection. We have discoloration of the iris. Um, it's red, it's erythemic. And then we also have some kind of haziness to the anterior chamber, which is aqueous flare. And so the anterior chamber is often affected in addition to the posterior segment um, in dogs and cats with blastomycosis. 
Cytology is an important part of the diagnostic investigation and an important diagnostic test. You're not going to find blastomyces yeast in every animal that has blastomycosis, but in many cases it's worth looking. And so the organisms here, they are relatively large. They have a double refractile wall and they have broad-based budding. And you kind of make out two organisms there broadly attached. Now, these organisms are too big for phagocytosis in many cases. So they're usually extracellular. Often the inflammatory response around those organisms is very, very thick. It can actually make finding the organisms difficult. Again, you're not going to find uh, organisms in every case, and so non-invasive biomarkers are really an important part of the diagnostic investigation. Uh, the test of choice, the first test to consider when um, trying to diagnose blastomycosis is an antigen test. This test detects uh, antigen from the cell walls, more specifically galactomannan. This antigen is continuously shed. Um, so it's constantly replacing this antigen in the cell wall and then shedding that. Um, it's soluble, so it's found in urine, it's found in serum, and it can be found in other body fluids. It's a very high performing test. Um, Mira Vista does offer this antigen test, and in urine, it's slightly more sensitive than looking for antigen in serum. The sensitivity is around 93% in both dogs and cats, and specificity is high. And so non-fungal versus fungal disease, the specificity is about 98% um, for both sample types. It uh, should be noted that there, there is some cross-reactivity with blastomyces antigen and especially histoplasma antigen. There's much lesser cross-reactivity with coccidioides antigen. And the blastomyces antigen concentration in urine does also provide some prognostic information. When the urine antigen concentration is greater than 5, about 60% of those dogs survived long-term. When the urine antigen is less than 5, all of the dogs survived. And this was from a relatively recent study from the University of Minnesota. Antibody testing is the other non-invasive biomarker. There's really two types of antibody tests, and we'll talk about both of those. The first is an EIA, an enzyme immunoassay, um, developed at MiraVista and offered only by MiraVista. It has a sensitivity of over 90%. The most recent study um, showed a sensitivity of 95%. Um, with a high specificity of 97%. This test specifically um, detects antibodies to the BAD1 antigen, which is only expressed after the mold converts to a yeast in the body. So when do we use the antibody EIA? Well, we use it if the antigen test is negative and we're still suspicious. About 4 to 5% of dogs with blastomycosis will be antigen negative and IgG antibody positive. So in that case, it's really used more as a secondary test. The other antibody test that is available in veterinary medicine is an immunodiffusion. Many labs offer an immunodiffusion. A lot of times they're part of what's called the fungal panel, where there may be an antibody immunodiffusion test available for histo, blasto, and coccidioides, for example. What you should know about the immunodiffusion test for blastomycosis is that it has a low sensitivity. It's right around 50%. So it's similar to flipping a coin. And for that reason, we really don't recommend um, the antibody immunodiffusion um, for the diagnosis of blastomycosis in dogs. In cats, it's still the only available antibody test. So just to put that into an algorithm, we always start with a suspicion of blastomycosis. And if we can do cytopathology, if we can do it non-invasively without anesthesia and find the organism, then that's great. That's, that's highly specific for blastomycosis and we know that we need to start treatment. In many cases, you either can't get to the location where the disease is, or you do, you sample it, you find inflammation, but you don't find any fungal organisms. In that case, we need to test urine for antigen, and if that's positive with the appropriate clinical signs, then you have enough there to make that diagnosis and treat with antifungal therapy. If the urine antigen test is negative, that's where you should consider serum, antigen, and antibody testing, and that will pick up most of that seven percent or so that will be negative on the urine antigen test. Now, if the additional serum testing is negative, um, you might have to consider more invasive testing, potentially fungal culture of body fluids or tissues that are affected. And, you know, of course, we need to reconsider our diagnosis at that point, because if all of those are negative, blastomycosis becomes pretty unlikely. We really won't address uh, treatment at all in this presentation, but other than this short note, in that itraconazole is the drug of choice for dogs and cats that can be treated on an outpatient basis. 
Remember to check itraconazole blood levels. And for life-threatening disease, amphotericin B is the treatment of choice. Treatment monitoring, or when to stop treatment. Generally, we would never treat for less than six months. So a minimum of six months duration. Many animals that have disseminated disease will need a much longer treatment duration than six months. But a very minimum of six months, we want to treat past the point where we have a resolution of clinical signs, of physical exam abnormalities, and also of imaging abnormalities. So for example, if thoracic radiographs were abnormal at baseline, then we'd like to see those normalized. Remember some pulmonary scarring, meaning focal unstructured interstitial disease can exist long-term, but in general, there should be drastic improvements in the imaging changes. Um, there's really should treat until there's no detectable antigen in urine. And we recommend testing at baseline and then every three months. Um, about 5% of the time, dogs especially will remain low antigen positive. So a low concentration of antigen um, after they reach remission. And so again, it's only about 5% of the time uh, if they are less than 0.4 nanograms per mil on two occasions, at least three months apart, that might also be an appropriate time to stop treatment if all the other uh, criteria have been met to stop treatment. So meaning we've treated for a minimum of six months and we've had a resolution of signs, exam abnormalities, and imaging abnormalities. After treatment, uh, antigen concentrations will increase with disease relapse. So we recommend rechecking an urine antigen at six months and then annually, and then again during treatment, don't forget to check itraconazole blood levels. Uh, this is an inexpensive test that accounts for the parent drug and all the active metabolites. And there's so much variability from dog to dog and cat to cat as far as how they absorb the drug that we really recommend checking blood levels. You can check those three weeks after starting the drug. And it's ideal to check a trough level, meaning to draw that blood sample within four to six hours of that next dose. And I think with using that, you can minimize adverse effects, you can ensure a positive outcome, and um, that, that those are all good things for the, for the treatment of blasto. So that's, uh, that's all we have for blastomycosis and diagnosis today. Um, we love to hear about your cases and your questions. Um, feel free to contact us at Miravista Diagnostics. That, that's 888-841-8387, and you can check us on, out online at miravistavets.com.